Hi there and welcome to Clover Press's YouTube channel. We have an interview today about the creators of the new graphic novel, The Golem of Venice Beach. This is Hanan Beiser and Chris Stevens. Uh, I want to introduce I want you guys to introduce yourselves. Can you tell me a little bit about yourselves? Hanan, let's talk about you first. Okay, uh, it's Hanan Beiser and um, uh, I'm originally from New York, uh, New York City, Queens and Manhattan. And uh, I moved out to California a couple of years ago and uh, was first living in Venice Beach. And that's part of the process that ended up becoming this book, Living in Venice Beach. Um, and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay. And Chris? Hey, yes. My name is Chris Stevens, and I'm the editor of The Golem of Venice Beach. Um, I've, uh, I've worked in comics for about... 12 years, uh, making some books for Dark Horse, uh, self-publishing and winning some Eisner Awards along the way. And uh, for the last two years or so, I've been uh, squarely doing freelance editing, the, um, the jewel of which, and uh, my most favorite, uh, I shouldn't say a favorite, but my, my favorite project, uh, being my work with Anon on the Golem of Venice Beach. Can you describe, either of you two, describe Golem of Venice Beach in just a few sentences? What is the premise of the story? It's about a mythological being out of Jewish legend and uh, stories from uh, Eastern Europe around for centuries, living in today's Venice Beach and trying to find his way in the world. Um, he doesn't look like the typical golem which we've seen in other books so he's not this big rocky mound of mud or brick or, or, or stone or whatever he looks like a very big youthful human being so i always love the idea of taking concepts from one uh mythology let's say or legend and putting it into today's times no, that's great. Uh, I, I I love the the blending of the ancient and the modern in this book. I think it really works well. Um, can you tell me? I've never been to Venice Beach before. Can you describe that city? Because I think that's such an important part of the the story that's being told. Oh yeah, De Venice Beach is definitely a character. So uh, coming from New York, and uh, I was uh, I, I've spent some time in the in uh, Greenwich Village and the West Village and all that. It's got a really funky vibe to it. So uh, moving to LA, Venice Beach has a real New York feel to it to me. Just because people are out walking about, uh, they're not just driving in their cars from one place to another. It's got a, a great New York vibe, even though there's no beach, no palm trees in New York. Um, but I felt a great affinity towards it. And it's got, you know, it's got everything from high sophisticated stores to a place that will, you know, sell you tube socks and t-shirts for $1.99. It's got a great funky vibe to it. Very bohemian, very eclectic, very fun. Uh, but there's also a dark side to it, which a lot of people may not be aware of because, you know, when the sun goes down, they disappear. But I lived there for a couple of years and the dark side is definitely there when the sun goes down. A lot of shadows, a lot of, you know, there's stuff that's going on at night that you really don't want to be there at night. But during the day, it's beautiful. It's funky. It's uh, sunny. It's uh, tourist. It's a spectacle. And at night, you know, it's uh, it's a little bit seedy, a little bit dangerous. Um, so that kind of appealed to me in creating a graphic novel, a story that dichotomy of day versus night, sun versus uh, darkness. And so that's kind of like another very impactful uh, part of the story. I've never been to Venice either, Curtis, but I feel like, uh, you know, not to sound funny, I feel like I have after, you know, working on the book and mm -hmm. Hanan uh, was very passionate about representing uh, the, the full spectrum of Venice, sort of what he was just speaking of there, that it is, uh, you know, by day very much a, a sun-drenched, touristy, let's sit on the beach. And, you know, a lot, a lot of people have heard of Muscle Beach, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day, lifting right on the beach. And, uh, but, you know, it's got a homeless problem. It's got all the problems of, uh, of, of, of an urban area, 
yet it's located in a very, you know, uh, paradise of a location. So that juxtaposition, especially when you're playing it out in a visual medium like comics, I thought that was a lot of, uh, that was one of the big thrills to explore and then see Vanessa Cardinale, who handled that section of the story, uh, to see her bring it to life the way she did uh, over the course of time, uh, you know, it was a real thrill, it gave it a real sense of place and definitely one of the strengths of the book, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, like just like uh, just to expound on what Chris said, I really, really wanted to have that sense of place uh, within the book. I grounded in like, you know, the buildings, the murals, the even some of the people that you would see in Venice Beach, they show up in the book. I mean, it's really a certain place. You know, it's it takes place today. Um, and uh, if you walk around Venice, you know, and you've read the book, you'll recognize some things if you walk around there. Oh yeah, I saw that. Oh yeah, I saw that too. Um, so I really, really, as Chris said, wanted to ground it in a real place. And as you said, uh, to make it a character within the story itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's touch a little bit on the, the, the Jewish history. So in terms of like the legend of the golem and things like that, yeah, not just the legend of the golem, but you, we also dive into different p parts of history that are really important to Jewish history as well. So, um, sure, yeah, sure. bringing all of that to the table. Well, you know, it starts off in medieval Europe, in Prague, where the golem was created. And this is a real legend out of Jewish mythology, let's call it, of legend, of the golem of Prague, right. Prague in the now the Czech Republic, there are stories and legends about this man, this rabbi from the late 1500s, the 16th century in uh, Prague, who was a, the greatest rabbi of his time, let's call it. Um, he was very uh, uh, knowledgeable of the mysti mystic arts of Kabbalah. Um, and the legends say that he created this creature out of stone, mud, clay, it varies, um, as a protector to his people. So that's a real legend. It's ba and it's a real man, whether or not he actually created a golem or not, he was a real living, breathing man known as the Maharal. So I thought, okay, uh, I wanted to create something that out of my own mythology, let's call it, um, uh, stories that I heard when I was younger. And I also thought I wanted to span the centuries. So in the original legend, um, the golem does its job of protecting the Maharal's people, uh, um, but it did it a little too well. It ran amok. It's a berserker. So, you know, if you think of Wolverine in comic books, you know, once he starts going, there's no stopping him. So the decision was made, according to the stories, to put him uh, back into suspended animation after he was created, not back, but into suspended animation, let's call it. And there's a legend today that he exists somewhere in the attic of this particular building in old Prague. Um, so I started thinking about that, you know, uh, you know, Eastern Europe is, has had some tumultuous times over the centuries. So I figured, you know, come sometime around World War II, if I could have brought the golem back to life, I would have done it. So I have this resurrection story that one of the descendants of that rabbi uh, resurrects the golem at that time to uh, help save his family. Um, and then at that point, I figured, you know, that was only 80 years ago. Um, I figured it would still be walking around in today's times. So that's, that's the three eras that this book covers. It covers the origin story in medieval uh, Prague. It covers the resurrection story during the height of World War II. Um, and then it covers today of what the golem is doing today in modern times. Definitely a creature out of its own element, out of its time, and really does not have a place in this world, but it still exists. 
Wow. Uh, when was the first time you heard the Golem story? Do you remember? So I don't remember exactly uh, the first time I heard the legend of the, the story, you know, just from school or, or, or whatever, fairy tales or whatever. But I do recall that the first time I saw it in a comic book form um, was in uh, Strange Tales number 174, um, which has a great cover by Gil Kane. And the interior art is by uh, John Buscema, uh, one of my favorite artists of all time. I love Gil Kane too, but John Buscema is like, you know, he's right up there for me because of Conan the Barbarian. Um, yeah. So uh, that's the first time I saw it in a comic book, let's say. And I think uh, the Golem appeared like in maybe three issues of Strange Tales. Um, and then it kind of like disappeared. It might have shown up like in a Marvel, uh, a Marvel two in one with a thing. So that's probably the first time I saw it as a comic book form and it imprinted on me. It was a di it's a different looking kind of Golem. It doesn't look humid. Yeah. It looks like this big monument of stone. Um, and you know, it was interesting, the Marvel two in one, which is always the thing with another uh, character and they team them up together. Cause in my mind, uh, the thing is actually kind of yeah. like right. an embodiment of the golem as well, especially created by Jack Kirby mm -hmm. and Stan Lee, you know, a, a creature made out of rocks. And the first incarnation of the thing, uh, Jack Kirby for Fantastic Four number one, it just kind of looks like mud. Uh, it's it's big, much more, yeah, much more clay, mud. Yeah, absolutely. Clay, mud, you know, like flowing yeah. lava, although it wasn't hot or whatever. And then eventually the, yeah, the thing became this rocky uh, creature. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, Jack Kirby is definitely an inspiration for me. Um, and so the thing, and then seeing the Golem in comic books, uh, that, that's kind of like imprinted on me, definitely. Yeah, the thing is Jewish himself, like Ben Grimm's character. So yeah, you know that just that just came out like ten years ago. Yeah, all the years, you know, Marvel Comics didn't say the religion of uh, different characters. You know, right. kind of like retrofitting over the course of the past decade. Let's say certain characters are have these certain backgrounds. They're retrofitting. I wonder if Kitty Pride was the first character that they just outright said was such and such because they uh, were very yeah. open that she was jewish but, but the thing you're definitely right back in the 80s right and on the 90s yeah. they didn't say that he was i mean they hinted at it right because he used I mean, little was benjamin you know but when but when bendis became sort of more of the architect of marvel and he's obviously jewish himself like that that connection became uh explicit i would say so yeah so much so that in the past 10 years the thing not only has had a bar mitzvah as an adult, <laughs> as an adult bar mitzvah oh, i didn't know that got married to alicia in a jewish wedding mm -hmm. um, oh okay so uh <laughs> yeah I, I think you know i'm not positive but i think the character sabra from marvel comics mm -hmm. i remember her an israeli super soldier she i don't know if she superseded kitty pride or not i'm not positive they might have been right around the same time right uh, but, uh, but yeah, Kitty Pride was obviously in the X-Men, a much bigger book. But, you know, Kitty Pride, yeah, definitely was cool when that happened. And, uh, but it's been pretty cool. And I've been reading up on these things, all on the retrofitting. You know, some of them make a lot of sense um, because uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at Marvel Comics and DC Comics, there really wasn't a lot of representation, not only of Jewish characters, let's say, but of like the, the whole rainbow the panoply of different people who enjoy comic books so i've really enjoyed watching you know some of these things you know i think it's cool that nick fury in most people's mind now is black that's really cool i think retrofitting uh, makes sense because it just can't all be the way that it was before well, um, sure yep got to evolve with the times Comics were invented by the Jews. Between Jerry Siegel, Joe Schuster, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, Gil Kane, uh, you know Joe Kubert, um, you know these are like the these are like the Mount Rushmores of comic books. Yep. Um, and they they created the comic book forum that we enjoy today. Even going back to the 1930s with Superman and uh, Schuster and Siegel, but they were very aware of not trying to uh, 
put their own feelings or their own identity into comic books. Um, and that's why it was very, um, I don't know if you want to call it whitewashed or whatever, but it was just basically, it just wasn't discussed. Everybody was just, you know, religion wasn't discussed, ethnicity what wasn't even there. Um, so I think it's really cool seeing characters that I grew up with having different backstories um, and uh, including a whole, you know, all of a, what, you know, uh, what, what today is, as you said, you know, times change and mm -hmm. uh, people want to enjoy comic books that they can identify with. Like with what Chris said, I would, that was a big identif uh, identifying factor for me when I read that Kitty Pride in the X-Men and I saw that, that issue that it was, you know, uh, that she, quotation marks, was revealed as uh, being a Jewish character off the bat. I thought that right. was really cool. Well, and then you bring that to today when you're creating this book, and now you have the freedom in comics to openly talk about all of this. In fact, if you read this book, it's quite an education on, um, you know, the different types of foods and the different language and everything. Like you, you cram a lot of that in here to show this rich tapestry of, of culture uh, with, through, through the pages. And, and that's, that also goes along with Venice Beach, you know. Uh, Venice Beach, it's a, it's, a whole, it's a whole spectacle of different kinds of people. Um, and I wanted to include that quotation marks melange. You know, uh, people call them melting pot, whatever it is. Um, so coming from New York, that's what, I, that's what I grew up with. That's what I'm comfortable with. And, uh, you know, Venice Beach, I felt an a, a affinity to that. Um, whether it's, you know, some characters speak exclusively in Spanish because that's how it is. The, you know, this is Southern California. That's how it is. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to make sure that everybody's not the same. I wanted to show that there are all different types of people, all different. You know, I have somebody speaking uh, a language from Ghana in, in, uh, in the book. I have somebody speaking Spanish in the book. I have, you know... Uh, just the, the different the different languages the the the, the different uh, the different cultures just all mixing it up and that's kind of like what I'm used to and that's what I wanted to, to display. Of course, I'm more knowledgeable in my own culture, so I have probably more details about that. Um, but I try to mix in as much as possible other things and other cultures and because. Mm -hmm. It's, it's Southern California, it's LA, that's what it is. Yeah, and that comes across really well. Like the, I love the, 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 the other main character in this book has a history with Aztec folklore and mythology, and, and that's really cool to see that come in, and um, yeah, yeah, really neat. I, and I, I hope I do it justice. I, you know, I did a lot of research as much as I could. Uh, I made sure that my Spanish was correct. I, I ran it by a friend of mine to make sure I'm using the right words, the right slang. Right. Um, I, I hope I'm being true to it. Um, uh, it. You know, it's a funny thing, you know, and I kind of like touch on this, but it might be more apparent in the future. But, you know, uh, I mentioned before that the, 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 the man who created um, the golem was a master of Kabbalah, right? So as it turns out, uh, the first person to write down all these mystic things of Kabbalah was a Spanish rabbi um, from Spain, Spanish. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's always been a very, uh, a very significant connection between Judaism and Spanish culture. People might not know this, um, but back in the middle ages, uh, the Jews of Spain reached a, uh, a high mark of society before the Spanish Inquisition. And once the Spanish Inquisition hit, that kind of disappeared. Okay. But, you know, if you go along to that old Monty Python thing, nobody expects <laughs> Spanish Inquisition. Um, so there's a lot of correlation of Spanish uh, culture and language. And I kind of like tried to transport it over the Atlantic Ocean into Southern California so it became more like Mexican Spanish culture mm -hmm. uh, mixed in with some Jewish culture. Wow. So I 
tried to work that out. So hopefully that works as well. Yeah, it's very it's a very cool mix. Just before we move on to the artists in this book, because there are a lot of artists, and I do want to talk about that for sure, but I want to talk about the road to making this graphic novel a reality, because I know that this is something, it's been in the works for quite a while, even before it came to Clover Press, right? Yes. Yes. Um, so I'll just start it, and then Chris can take over, because, you know, without him, it never would have gone on to 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 be finished. So, um I had written uh, the, the, the story. Um, it originally was a screenplay and I took a class at UCLA about how to write for comic books called uh, Writing for Sequential Art. And then it took me a couple of years to write the story out completely in comic book form. And then I knew I didn't know enough about comic books to put the whole thing together. I was very aware of that. Um, and I knew that I wanted really, really great artists on this. So I started looking for an editor. Um, and I happened to come across a posting uh, by Chris on this Facebook uh, group, uh, connecting writers with artists. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I looked, uh, I saw what Chris posted. I looked him up. I saw the books that he had worked on and the most impressive at the time, something which he had just finished up or was had recently finished up, what this book uh, celebrating the art of, uh, of Nemo, the classic, uh, ca uh, classic little Nemo. Little, uh, celebrating the art of Little Nemo, the classic right. uh, newspaper uh, uh, character from the early 20th century. Yep. Um, and I saw, I just saw the list of artists that Chris had worked with and just like one after the other, after the other, just amazing artists. So I contacted Chris and, uh, and uh, he agreed to come on board. And then, uh, then Chris and I would talk about artists and uh, how to get this done. And he was kind of like mentoring me on how comic books are created and, uh, you know, it was just a whole process. I had had a company called Locust Moon, uh, where I owned a comic shop in Philadelphia from 2010 to 2016. And it, through the course of that, I uh, had a small press called Locust Moon Press, where we put together, uh, we made a couple books for Dark Horse called the Once Upon a Time Machine books. And we self-published uh, maybe, maybe 10 books. The the, the, the best of which, and, and the one that had traction, was called Little Nemo, Dream Another Dream, uh, which Hanan was referencing. And I did, I was lucky to work with uh, a lot of great artists on that. And I had started to get it, I had gotten into comics as a writer uh, at first, um, you know, uh, many moons ago, and uh, had an interesting uh, beginning where I started off working with artists like Arthur Adams and Jay Lee, who... Jay is in the Golem of Venice Beach and was one of my first friends in comics. And uh, I started off working with, uh, you know, um, artists who were, you know, very well established and guys that I admired a lot. And that was sort of my, my goal. I wanted to work with the people who turned me on. And uh, there were a lot of ups and downs to that. A lot of that work hasn't been published yet. Some of it didn't get completed, uh, you know, long and winding road. Through the course of that though, uh, when I, I moved to Philadelphia, my wife was going to med school and I wound up meeting uh, the two guys who would become my partners in Locust Moon. And we had a good five, six, seven year run there. We won some Eisner Awards with the Little Nemo book and, you know, had some success. But, uh, you know, those type of partnerships are hard and it sort of ran its course uh, in 2016. By 2017, Locust Moon was done with. And I had some health issues where I had a stroke in 2016 and just wasn't uh, feeling tip top and hadn't done much of anything uh, in comics for a bit. I had a book come out from Dark Horse in 2018, the second Once Upon a Time Machine book, but uh, I really wasn't doing much. And my, my um, ex-partner in Locust Moon, Andrew Carl, had urged me to you know, try to get into freelance editing and just thought I would enjoy it and be good at it. And with my connections with the artists, it might be you know, something to do. And uh, the Facebook post that Hanan referenced a minute ago, that was one of, if not my very first, just like, <laughs> hey, this is how the world works now. I'm here, you know, Facebook group trying to find work, right? Here's what I've done and here's what I maybe could do for people, blah, blah, blah. 
and Hanan reached out and, um, you know, uh, you never know if someone's serious or not, right? Like I'm learning that every, every <laughs> week in this freelance life. Um, but um, we had an interesting exchange through email and I could tell he was serious and he was no dumb. And he didn't know, he was smart enough to know what he didn't know, you know? And um, having been a longtime comic book fan and also uh, successful in his own career, he understood the barriers maybe for a first time writer in comics, um, especially those barriers were always there when the options were just DC, Marvel and, you know, whoever else at, uh, what, at the time. But now there's similar barriers, even though it's like the Wild West and it's wide open and anybody can self-publish and be on Instagram and Webtoons and all that kind of stuff. Um, he understood that he, he, you know, wasn't getting any younger and he wanted to take his best shot. And, and this story that was personal to him that he'd worked on very hard, uh, that he poured his heart into over X amount of years, uh, he wanted to see it done justice. And his mandate, and Hanan, you know, not talking out of school, but he wanted stars. And when I said, hey, you know, that's great, but, you know, you, you know, like that can be, you know, that can be hard to put together. They can be difficult to deal with. It can be, you know, a, a tough road to hoe. And uh, he was prepared to do it and, and hold up his end of it. And once I realized that, and I had seen the script and talked to Anon a little bit about it. It just sort of uh, right off the bat, it became, I know you said you wanted to get into the artist a little later, Curtis, but Bill Sienkiewicz, who did the prologue, uh, the first seven pages of the book, and then obviously the, the wraparound cover that folks are going to see and have seen online, I guess. Um, it just popped in my head. I was friendly with Bill. We had a really great time working on the Little Nemo book. We were on the phone a lot during that. He'd come to Philadelphia uh, a couple of years in a row and spent, we made a book for the Philadelphia Museum of Art that he did the cover for. And that was displayed at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And he was in town for about a week for that. So I'd spent enough time with him, been on the phone with him enough that I was hopeful he would say yes, even though it was an unknown project, no publisher, an unknown writer. Um, I was hopeful. And once he said yes, and uh, you know, it sort of started to take form from there. Me and Hanad would kick around, what about this person? Or maybe this would be great. And, you know, eventually we wound up uh, where we are. Yeah, so I'm going to list off um, all of these names that you have here. Of course, the main artist, uh, Vanessa Cardinale, uh, but you also have Bill Sienkiewicz, Jay Lee, Michael Allred, Paul Pope, Stephen Bissett, Nick Patera. Like these are some uh, pretty notable names in the history of, of comics. And, uh, and it's <laughs> just great that you have them all, all together here. Can you tell me a little bit about how you envisioned them fitting into your story? I always knew, and as we discussed, there are three eras that the story takes place in. There's a prologue in medieval Europe. There's a resurrection uh, story in World War II, uh, Czech Republic, uh, also Europe. And then there's the current, uh, the main part of the book taking place in today's Venice Beach. So I always envisioned having different artists for those three parts. Um, I knew I couldn't afford to get superstar artists, well, let's just say the biggest superstar artists to do the entire book. I couldn't afford that. Yeah. Um, but I had this seven page prologue um, and I had the cover and I had 10 pages of World War II flashbacks. And I also had this idea of creating a map of Venice Beach. Cause you know, as a kid growing up, a big influence on me is like, you know, the Lord of the Rings book um, and like the Hobbit book. And, you know, I remember as a kid looking at the back of the book at the map of, uh, of the world of the Hobbit to see where he's going. OK, he starts there and then he goes over there and then he ends up over there. Um, so I always envision trying to do some kind of map of Venice Beach. It kind of has morphed a little bit to be more like a visual, surreal uh, interpretation, which is cool. Um, so I always had that idea. And then I was open to other ideas for additional art in the back of the book. And then, you know, when Chris mentioned Bill Sienkiewicz um, for the prologue, it just immediately clicked. And the prologue and the cover, I think Chris suggested the prologue and the cover for Bill. Um, 
that really clicked. I mean, I'm a big fan of his uh, art that I grew up with, yeah. uh, Electra Assassin, Moon Knight, New Mutants. Um, that's what I grew up with. So, and then, uh, you know, we started talking about the different other parts of the book and Chris would make suggestions. So, uh, you know, he can take it from there. Yeah, Curtis, um, like Anand said, he had these different sections. Uh, let's say the, the World War II flashbacks. In my mind, while, you know, all of the script was, was well-written, it was the best written script I've seen from someone who hasn't done comics before for a first time, you know, comic script. It was, uh, you know, already in good shape when I got to it. But um, no matter how well you write, uh, and this is just my opinion personally, so as the editor, you know, I have to look at it from my lens uh, as well as the creator's, you know, um, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald could come back and write uh, Nazi World War II supernatural stuff. And it's just, we've seen a lot of it. And it, while the script was great in its own right and very clean and got the point across and paid respect to a very terrible, heavy, you know, un, un, we can't even really imagine how terrible, you know, we're dealing with concentration camp stuff. And, you know, there's no, there's not much light at the end of those tunnels. And taking that into account uh, and knowing, uh, you know, what Jay Lee does and, and uh, the sort of dark elegance that is just inherent in everything he does. Um, and Jay also has a, a grace to his stuff that doesn't matter if it's superheroes or, you know, Stephen King or whatever it is, uh, there's a gracefulness to it and elegance and a gravitas. And I thought that he would elevate what could be in the hands of even other great artists, material that might not hit the way that I imagined Nan wanted it to hit. And I just thought Jay could deliver uh, specifically and uh, on, on, on the, the sort of terrible weight of, of what those pages build up to without giving too much of it away. I love that the the term. Uh, what did you call it? Dark elegance. Uh, it oh, describes yeah. I mean, it I perfectly. Think, Jay's just a very everything he draws. It doesn't matter. He could do a, a SpongeBob thing or something, <laughs> and there's a sort of elegance to it. And uh, you know that's what he's developed into. Um, you know, from you know, it wasn't at the start of his career, but for the last you know twenty years or so, especially, yeah. it's just everything has got a sort of dark elegance, a gracefulness. And, and a gravitas. These these pages really required that um, yeah. in, in a way that I thought he could uniquely deliver. And he sure did. Like they are just absolutely brilliant. It's a great pairing. Uh, just and just with his the way his compositions and the, the way he forms his panels and everything just fits so well with the material that's being discussed. And same with Bill Sinkevich, like both of those artists have this dirty, gritty style that works so well for telling these dark these these uh, points in history and uh, and you contrast that with uh with vanessa cardinelli who brings a whimsy who brings um so many vibrant colors and like really emphasizes the other end of the spectrum of having this this fun environment of venice beach like i i the, the pairing of these artists all together couldn't be uh, more opposite but so complementary it's really Great. Yeah, and her style, uh, and her, like you said, her sense of color has really added a fantastic element to it. It's funny, um, it's kind of like, you know, you hear these stories of like parallel evolution, uh, you know, uh, creatures created on different sides of the world, which fill the same niche in biology. Yeah. Um, so the way that we found Vanessa, I, on that same Facebook uh, group, she had a posting. And again, like I said, I couldn't afford to do have Bill Sienkiewicz do 130 yeah. pages. Okay, I just couldn't afford it. Um, I don't know who could. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's anybody out there who can. Um, so I knew that we needed to get somebody uh, to do the be the main artist, uh, and just to put it, you know, in a simpler term, uh, not as well known at least in the United States, okay? So I was searching for an artist 
And, um, and I think Chris at the same time was also searching for an artist. You know, we were talking about the main artist and I came across the posting that Vanessa did in that same Facebook group. And I started you know, look at the, at the links that she had to her work. And, you know, I started thinking, oh, maybe this person. And so I reached out to Chris and said, well, what do you think about this person? And as, as I said, like parallel evolution, he had also, uh, you know, on his own had noticed her work as well. So he uh, also looked at it. I, he went to the specific links that I sent. So he started thinking in his mind, oh, okay, let, let's, see what, let's see what happens if I can reach out to her. That it is. It was an interesting um, little synchronicity there where Anon and I had pretty much stumbled across her at the same time um, in this Facebook group. Again, the same group Anon found me in. I think it's called Connecting Comics and Comic Writers and Artists. Yeah. It's very easy. Uh, and to the chagrin, and I believe me, I suffer the same uh, the same pains as writers trying to get a leg up. You know, nobody's going to read your script, but it's real easy to see artwork and go, yeah. all right, this person's got it. You can right. see it in five seconds, two seconds. And when I saw her stuff, you know, it was very clear that she had a, a cartoonist. Uh, she had like a full uh, toolbox. She could do everything uh well, I didn't know how well, but it was clear that, you know, her, her, her characters, her environments, uh, I didn't know she was calling herself at the time, but her color work, um, just, you know, a, a gifted cartoonist. And what wound up, I think, ultimately being most important, because Hanan and I had discussed um, never getting to the point of uh, actual, like, different names of different people, but just style-wise, we had discussed what might be right for the main narrative. And once I saw Vanessa and, and Hanan, I knew he liked her because he'd sent it to me already, you know, under his own steam. She brings, without giving too much of the story away, there's a major, you know, a female character who's central to, to the whole kit and caboodle. And there are, it's a mature story in the sense that it's about real people, even though it's fantastical, it's very grounded in real life. Uh, Curtis, you mentioned earlier about the foods and the different, you know, the, the different stuff. It's very grounded in real life. And when you have a story with a young male protagonist and a main female, you know, protagonist, there's going to be, you know, let's <laughs> say sparks that fly. There's going to be some romantic entanglements. In fact, that helps drive uh, a lot of the back end of the story is this romantic entanglement between the golem's ancestral handler and this mysterious, uh, you know, a mysterious uh, woman who is tied into these, as you said, Curtis, Aztec uh, mythology, mythological things. And Vanessa, uh, she just naturally br brings a feminine side to that. So now you're not just reading uh, what, you know, if not handled properly at its worst could just be male fantasy, right? It would never would have been that because Anand didn't write that kind of script. But, you know, at its worst, that's what we could have wound up with, perhaps. Vanessa, right away, right off the bat, you don't have to worry about that. Um, she brings a female uh, point of view and a feminine line, even though, you know, you're not going to see her work and go, oh, it must be a girl draw that. She still brings a touch to it. <laughs> that is different than a yeah. lot of guys would have. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when we do have uh, um, romantic scenes, even when we have the, the violence that's in the book, um, every, everything down to the, the little normal human moments, it's very, I enjoyed seeing it. And I thought it was beneficial to the overall story Hanan's trying to tell to have that feminine touch in there. And, um, you know, then the fact that she is not, uh, she's like a million miles away <laughs> from sort of the more traditional, um, even though that's fading a little now in the last couple of years, the more traditional sort of like house style that people, so like American style comics that, you know, and I love him, he's a hall of famer, but like the Jim Lee type style of artwork, she's a million miles away from that. She's more of, uh, you know, in the European cartooning school or influenced, uh, you know, in some ways by like a Paul Pope type guy or something, you know? Um, and that, again, that, that was the, to me, the proper tone. So it was, uh, it was just a nice little piece of happenstance that we both sort of Hanan found her and I had been looking at her. And uh, when I brought it to her and said, Hey, uh, you know, Bilson Kevich is, is going to do this. <laughs> that goes a long way. Uh, you know, I won't lie. I, I won't yeah. lie. You know, um, 
I was very impressed because, of course, your your script has so many different、um, emotional beats to it, like all over the place, and she nails all of them. Like you talked about the romantic and sexual nature of some of these scenes, but there's also like scenes of grief. And、oh, yeah. scenes of、uh, excitement, like the, the any time that there's there's a couple of chase scenes in there, and there's like gory violence, and like she doesn't shy away from any of this. There's stuff. deep she... reflection, you know, Curtis.、Yep. There's some deep, deep reflective moments on the、right. uh, on, on the on Steph's part, the older the older guy's part. Yes, so, that's yeah, right. Yeah, there is a range of、um, emotion, emotional material, and she can handle it all. We call her the engine a lot, Curtis, and you know she really is the engine of. of yeah. Of, This narrative, for sure. And it's it's not only the more dramatic things, like you described, whether it's the violent scene or the sexual scene or whatever. There are a lot of subtle things that may not be apparent,、uh, but but for me, I come from a film background, okay, and I try to instill some cinematic elements. To the story and to the layouts and to the to the beats as well, so I really like、uh, what I would call it、um, composition. How you frame a shot. I'm going to use a cinematic terms,、mm -hmm. okay?、Um, and then there are some really subtle pages, which are some of my favorite pages. The way that Vanessa drew them,、um, where. Um, you see, like half of a face. You know, you don't need to see. It's more dramatic just by seeing a partial face,、uh, and then she balances it correctly because this character you see the left side, and this character on the other side of the page you see the right side. So she balances it in a very cinematic way, which I love, I adore. That's what、uh, that's what I try to instill in the story. So as you describe, okay. There are a lot of people who can who can、uh, write. Or, no, a lot of people who can draw a really cool violent scene. You know,、uh, bodies flying, arms tearing off. But like having a conversation between two people、right. in a very in a very beautiful Venice Beach background, and having the panels be more than just squares. For somebody to pull a, put a full figure in, really lends a subtle nature that is more impressive to me than than the scene where bodies are flying or people or bullets are flying or whatever. Yeah, and those are great too. But the small little、uh, aspects, like there's a bathtub scene, if you recall, which is really a very small, intimate thing, and then the balance between. Uh, the two characters,、um, the two characters in the bathtub together. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm giving something away. But the way that they, the conversation plays off between them, there's just very little, small, little subtle things, which really are beautiful when you look at it on the page.、Mm -hmm. so、that's what excites me, which may not be as apparent than like you know,、uh, like I said, like the more violent scenes. I think people don't even realize how important those those like being able to compose a good talking heads page is. Like that could make or break a book. The 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 flow of the the story,、uh, and yeah, she does a really really great job of that.、Uh, now, where where is she located compared to you two? She's in Italy. I'm not、it's、sure exactly where, but she's in a small in town in Italy.、Um, yeah. Uh, wow. She's not even like, like in Rome. She's not in Rome. She's、yeah. in a small town in Italy,、uh, up near the north、uh, central part of Italy. Amazing. So, what was that collaboration like with the time difference and the being so far away? Well, it was mostly. I mean, in fact, it was all done through Facebook chats and email.、Um, but you know, the creative. End of it. The back and forth was all Facebook chats, and、um, yeah, the time difference is different.、Uh, but you know, it usually worked out. We would catch each other when I would wake up, which is you know like late morning. I would call it being generous, you know, <laughs> early afternoon, late morning, and、uh, you know, I would we would chat through it, and、um, 
And yeah, you know, uh, the three of us would, would work through, uh, you know, started with this, you know, script layouts, pencils, you know, very, uh, in that sense, a very traditional, you know, way of working, just going through each part of the process. And once she got the hang of Venice Beach, which you can imagine for an Italian girl who's never, I don't think she's ever been in the United States. So, wow. you know, yeah. and Hanan, to his credit, uh, really, we really were striving for authenticity. I took a ton of photographs. I mean, oh yeah, I, there was a lot of I reference. I mean, tons of photographs of like even small little things that would be cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, plus the whole, a uh, whole, whole uh, display, the, the 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 panorama of Venice Beach. So I took tons of photographs, and uh, yeah, so that was the research that she had to work from. Oh yeah, she had she had tons of reference, and once she got into the skin of things, I think it was pretty smooth sailing overall. You know, she was a treat to work with. Um, it's no surprise she wound up with the series of image. You know, sort of on the heels of this, um, as she was. You know, th that actually came out before this is going to come out. But I think you know it, it wound up uh, the uh, sort of attention that it was getting her, even in a you know just a low key way. Yeah. People talking it up, me posting about it, whatever I think helped her, you know, sure. land on that. And uh, she's had a good run on that and uh, a book called Slumber from Image. And um, I know she's doing some little short stories where she's writing and drawing her own stuff for a couple of different anthologies right now. And she's just terrific. I can't can't say I have the nature of my work. I haven't done a ton of books, but I've worked with well over, I mean, easily over a hundred artists uh, and a lot of them high level artists. Um, some of what you would call whatever superstars or whatever you want to call it. And she is, if she's not the most professional in terms of doing what she says she's going to do, hitting deadlines, uh, working with you to get the result, even if it's not easy to get the result. Um, she's, if she's not the most professional, she's, you know, top two, three, she's just a treat to work with on, on almost every level. Okay. Fantastic. Well, we only have a couple more minutes here left, but, uh, do you have anything else you want to say about, uh, the book in general, the project? I, I just think that, uh, I, I mean, in my humble, I am HO in my humble opinion, um, uh, I think it's a pretty good story. And I think the artwork, uh, I think the story and the artwork uh, are good matches. I'm the first one to say that when I look at comic books or when I look at graphic novels, the first thing that I that attracts me is the art. Of course, yeah. Um, the first thing you see on the cover and you look at the art and if the art sucks, it doesn't matter how great the story is. Um, I'm not gonna pick up that book if the art sucks. We should get you a T-shirt that says that on the front. <laughs> um, I'll wear one. We'll I wear that care. to conventions together. I don't care how great the story is. If the art sucks, it's a crappy book. Um, so I'm very happy that the art is really great. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping people think that the story is really great too. Yeah. And uh, I think that uh, people should give it a shot uh, and... Uh, and think that, you know, this is something that I want to take a look at. That's it. Great. Yeah, Curtis, I think it's one of the more impressive debut comics that folks are going to have seen. Uh, and I won't put, you know, I'm not going to say in the last 20 years or 30. I just think, period, it's one of the more impressive debut comics. It's very idiosyncratic and personal in the story that it's trying to tell and the characters that it's building. And to see that sort of uh, personal story told through the firepower of a, a true murderer's row. A lot of people use that for hype and, and marketing and say, oh, you know, superstar artists. But I mean, these guys, Curtis, like you said earlier, Bill Sienkiewicz is a legend. Jay Lee is a legend. Paul mm -hmm. Pope, Mike Allred, Stephen, yep. Stephen Bissett, who hasn't done much uh, in terms of interior pages by choice. Um, you know, focusing on his teaching career for the last couple of decades. I mean, he he came in and uh, gave us what he gave us. Nick Patara drew almost every character. I think he drew literally every character in the book. It's uh, wild. On, yeah. on, on, on one of his pages. Um, 
you know, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a well-honed tight adventure story in a sense that does take you through different time periods and different settings. But at the end of it, it all comes back to the characters and these artists in each their own way have like sort of illuminated a portion of each character's soul for you, uh, especially the goal of seeing him through the eyes of Paul Pope, Mike Allred, Steve, every artist has touched on the golem. And for a character who doesn't necessarily have a soul of his own or is trying to find it, or at least wrestling the fact with maybe he woke up and discovered he does have one, well, to see it through all their hands, I think is what's really going to be a thrill for most readers and uh, can't wait till the book's out in people's hands. Mm -hmm. and, and, I love, and I love the fact that, okay, we talked about Bill in the prologue and Jay Lee with the World War II stuff and Vanena, Vanessa with the, uh, the, the main part of the book, the, the, uh, in Venice Beach. But I, I love like the additional art also in the back of the book, how each different artist captured a different, uh, a different feeling, a different genre, a different aspect of the book. I mean, uh, as I mentioned, the map done by uh, Michael Allred, it's yep. just such a funky mix of color and display of real things in Venice Beach. And then Paul Pope just captured the perfect picture perfect day uh beach day between the golem and these two young characters that he's uh has a connection to and then i wanted to get some kind of horror stuff in there and stephen Bissett, you know we didn't even know what he was going to do he just <laughs> he just said do what you're going to do and we'll make it work uh we just gave a few little ideas and he went with it and then to have Nick Patara just wrap up the whole thing, the whole display of like the famous Venice Beach boardwalk of all these different people, characters, cultures, you know, ethnicities, yep. uh, age, uh, you know, just as a perfect way to close out the book uh, and uh, to uh, leave you with a really great feeling after having finished reading it. So there you have it, folks. We are talking about The Golem of Venice Beach by Hanan Beiser and edited by Chris Stevens, my two guests here. Thank you so much for being here today. If you want a copy, you can go to cloverpress.us and order a copy there, or you can go to your local comic shop and order a copy, or just or Amazon even, just uh, see that you can pick this up because you won't be disappointed. This is a good one. Uh, so I want to thank you two for both being on the show here today. Um, do you have any Instagrams or, um, or Facebooks you want to... Uh, promote i don't but thanks for having me curtis okay it. great talk um, can't wait till people see the book yeah i mean i've got an instagram called the golem of venice beach where i just post uh um comic books from my own personal collection plus when the kickstarter campaign was going on i was posting there so uh you know i'll, I'll keep people updated clover press is probably the best place to know what's going on uh, in terms of, uh, of when you can get the book in your own hands. And, uh, you know, I hope you do. Yep. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.